Greetings, and welcome to, the, to today's webinar, Game Elements for Learning, sponsored by Academic Partnerships. I'm Casey Green, the founding director of the Campus Computing Project and the author of the Digital Tweed blog at Inside Higher Ed. The featured speaker for today's webinar on Gaming Elements for Learning is Gerald Petrozella, who is the coordinator of academic technology at the Massachusetts College of Liberal Arts and also an adjunct instructor in philosophy. For anyone in the audience who believes that humanists may have issues with technology, please know that Gerald earned his PhD in philosophy, specializing in ancient Greek philosophy, ethics, and Greek and Roman language and literature. Well done, Gerald. So let's take a quick moment for some housekeeping before we begin. We encourage your questions throughout the webinar. Uh, Adobe Connect is the platform we're using. Please enter questions in the text field at the bottom of the q and A. Should be just to the right. You'll see it. It's circled in the uh, on the graphic here as a sample. Uh, You'll be able to see your own questions and direct any questions, uh, but you will not be able to see the questions from all the participants who will be flooding the question box with questions like yours. And if you'd like, please be sure to include your name and perhaps even your institution if you'd like us to mention it, if you get extra points for the webinar when doing so. And we'll be presenting questions to Gerald throughout the webinar, but you can understand, of course, we won't be able to get to all the questions that come in. Typically, we get several hundred throughout the course of these one-hour programs. Uh, but they will be archived, and we'll try to do some follow-up, and we'll try to follow the, most, the strongest themes throughout the questioning. We will not be using the raise your hand function today, so you don't have to worry about that. Again, questions just go through the Q&A bar to the right. And we are recording today's presentations. So we will send an email with links to the video and how to download the slide deck to all registered participants later today or early tomorrow. Again, we will make the video and the slide deck available. Finally, by way of introduction, uh, this is a rem reminder, rather. Uh, today's webinar, Game Elements for Learning, also serves as an introduction to a full mini MOOC by the same name, also led by Gerald and also sponsored by Academic Partnerships. The Game Element mini MOOC begins next week on July 1st. Uh, we'll bring back this registration slide at the end of the program. And with that, I'm pleased to welcome and introduce Gerald Petruzella of the Massachusetts College of Liberal Arts. Gerald, the screen and the webinar are now yours. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Casey. And uh, hello, everybody. Um, it's great to see so many of you here today. Uh, and it's really my honor and pleasure to talk a little bit uh, about my own experience with gaming and education. So my first slide that you're looking at right now uh, is captioned, Serious Gaming, Earnest Gaming, Games for Change, Edu Gaming. These are much in the news these days, right? And if you follow any sort of educational news sources, You've probably heard about this, and the fact that you're here today uh, is evidence of that. Um, there's a lot going on with this. Um, it's a really fascinating time uh, to be thinking about teaching, learning, and you know something that is seems seemingly a natural part of, of human behavior and has been for quite a while, this business of playing games. You're looking at you know just a small sampling here of the range uh, of, of folks who are doing serious thinking and scholarship. Uh, about these topics, uh, going back to Bernard Suits uh, down in the lower left-hand corner, who was a philosopher, wrote a book called The Grasshopper Games, Life in Utopia back in the 1970s, all the way up to you know present-day stuff with Ian Bogost, uh, Jane McGonigal's TED Talk, James Paul G. out of Arizona State University. Um, this is just showing you a small sampling of some of the serious scholarship uh, that has been dud, done on these topics. You'll notice in the right-hand column, I've listed some of the more recent stuff in the past decade or decade and a half. But the left-hand column is where it's really interesting. Um, this is not uh, a new thing. This is not a new phenomenon. Uh, and in fact, a fair amount of scholarship around games and education uh, stretches back several decades at least. Um, and I, you know, I didn't do my graduate work in gaming or educational gaming or anything like that. So I am reveling in discovering what's out there, uh, which, is, which is a really fantastic experience for me personally and professionally. So for those of you who are interested in this, um, my sense of this is, and, and my recommendation, recommendation to you is, um, this is not a fad. All right? This is something that has serious scholarly foundations um, and, and a long tradition in history. Here's where I started. All right. Um, my background, as Casey mentioned, is in uh, philosophy, in ancient Greek philosophy specifically. Not something that you'd necessarily think would lead to um, would lead to experience in gaming in education. But um, playing a game, says Bernard Suits, 
is the voluntary attempt to overcome unnecessary obstacles. I think that frames things remarkably well uh, for me as an educator. Um, think about golf, right? Uh, one, of the, one of the most popular games that we, that we sometimes play. Um, I'm not a golfer myself, but I can understand the appeal of it. What is the appeal? Well, you have a purpose, right? You have the purpose to get this small ball into a hole. Um, but the interesting thing and the thing that makes golf a game rather than a simple, meaningless task is not the purpose by itself. Because if it were only the purpose that you were after in the game of golf, um, it would be a pretty dull game. You could pick up the ball in your hand, walk to the hole, drop it in. Hey, you've achieved the purpose. Um, it is the unnecessary obstacles that transform that tedious, meaningless task, or even that easy task, uh, into something that is actually fun and that people spend lots of time and lots of energy uh, participating in. Right. Um, I've laid out here underneath that quotation uh, some summaries of Jane McGonigal's uh, conceptualization of games. Um, and I should say, uh, just for purposes of clarity, Jane McGonigal is one theorist uh, around games, and there are many, many folks out there in the educational space doing analysis about these, and they will give uh, you know, many different theoretical approaches. So here's one that appealed to me. Right? Jane McGonigal talks about four important uh, necessary components uh, of what makes a game. Right? Needing that goal, right? needing to give players a sense of purpose that orients their participation. Having a rule set. Okay. Um, limiting the obvious ways of getting to the goal, right? So hearkening back to that example I gave about golf, you're not allowed to simply pick up the golf ball in your hand, walk to the hole and drop it in, right? There are specific, uh, in some sense, unnecessary obstacles placed in the way. And those are not annoying or obnoxious, right? But rather these so-called unnecessary obstacles are what make for the game experience. Thirdly, there needs to be a strong feedback system in a good game, right? Players need to understand quickly, easily, uh, and directly where they're at, what their actions have accomplished, how far this choice has taken them towards their goal. Right? Um, people play games in good faith that if they follow the rule set, um, there is a good chance that they will win the game. Right? Um, and this is the feedback system's role. Right, to reinforce that rule set, to reassure and motivate the players of the game that they're doing it right and that by doing it right, um, they can get what they want. And lastly uh, is, is the hard bit, the fourth bit, is voluntary participation. Uh, upon a little reflection, it does seem obvious or intuitive, perhaps, uh, that people who choose to play a game choose willingly uh, and not under compulsion. Um, there are theoretical reasons that this is important, right? As McGonagall says, this establishes common ground for multiple players together, and it also establishes the game space as something safe uh, and pleasurable, right? A framework that allows for creativity, experimentation, risk taking. Um, so these four key elements uh, represent something important uh, in my understanding uh, of games in general. Now, when we take uh, these sorts of ideas and transfer them into games in education specifically. Uh, I'm, I'm taking a little look here at uh, work done by James Paul G, uh, another one of the, the big names in the space right now, uh, who has done some further analysis not just about games per se, but games specifically within the context of an educational environment. Uh, and he talks about these six properties, uh, first of all, um, whether gameplay allows or encourages uh, students slash players to take advantage of this rule system of the game uh, to achieve goals that matter to them. Right? Uh, and I've, I've, I've sort of personally labeled this as, as approaching the question of strategy or creativity. Right? The second property, dealing with agency as I think of it, right? how much control in the game uh, does the player have over what happens? Thirdly, all right, addressing the issue of purposefulness. Um, simply put, does the game offer experiences that count as, as good learning, all right, um, that are not simply meaningless or arbitrary or just fun? Fourthly, on the issue of feedback, right, uh, as, as Jane McGonigal mentioned also, all right, does the game give players, students, uh, a, a strong sense of feedback? 
right? Uh, not just at the end of the game or at the end of the semester or at arbitrary, you know, stop points, but ideally speaking, uh, consistently throughout the experience of game playing. Fifth property, right? Um, it addresses the issue, I think, of transfer, right? Which is one of the really important questions that we try to achieve in our teaching. Taking students' learning within our classrooms uh, and enabling them and encouraging them uh, to take those skills and, and, and learned items out of the classroom after, afterwards, right? So whether a successful game uses its gameplay and its models to encourage students to think, aha, what I've learned here is not simply constrained by the framework of this game environment or this classroom environment, but uh, matters somewhere else beyond this class, maybe in a, in a later class uh, or maybe even not in a class at all. And then sixthly, uh, G talks about this, this property that uh, games encourage the player to be unique, uh, to, to not necessarily follow a preset script through the game. Right? Uh, and I think of this in terms of ownership. Um, Ideally, students are not following a preset uh, plot line throughout a game experience, um, but rather uh, a true, you know, effective game experience seems to me to involve students making effective choices that actually influence the outcome. So um, these are some, some theoretical uh, frameworks that I uh, brought to bear in my own experience in my own teaching. So speaking of which, um, Enough of the theoretical abstract stuff. I'm going to start talking about um, what I have been focusing on in my own experience uh, applying game principles in, in my classroom teaching. And throughout this presentation, uh, I've, I've sort of grouped some of these ideas into three major focuses. Um, firstly, um, curation and integration of open content and media. Um, I am a big proponent of open educational resources and their use. Um, I think this is a really exciting trend, uh, and uh, I'm doing what I can to be part of that and to think carefully and, and use those resources effectively. So um, the first third of what I'll talk about uh, is focusing on that. Uh, the second bit uh, is all about feedback. Right? The sort of feedback that certainly students get from me throughout the course of the game, uh, but also I'll talk briefly about some of the feedback that I get uh, from the game environment, uh, and, and that's equally important. And then thirdly, I'm going to talk about hybridity and or transfer, and I absolutely recognize that these are uh, distinct concepts, uh, both very important, but I do see uh, a connection and a bit of overlap. Uh, and so uh, when we get to that point, I'll talk about what was involved in my own experience with um, taking all of the multiple elements within the course game experience um, and promoting those as ways for students uh, to expand outside of the classroom. Gerald, this so, might be a good point for a, a couple of questions. I want to come back to one of the bullets in the McGonagall slide earlier. The fourth point about the voluntary nature, uh, I'm quoting, intentionally stressful and challenging work. Seems to me you've doubled down in, in one sense, both the teaching of philosophy and, and uh, ancient civilizations at one level, and then the technology is a layer between that. I mean, you're a trained humanist. Your, your background, formal training is ancient languages, literature, and culture. If you will, how did you get personally sucked into the technology vortex and you know even deeper into the gaming side of this? What was mm -hmm. what was that chasm that you crossed personally that, that brought you to where you are today and the work that you're currently doing? Sure. Yeah, that's a that's a great question. I'm happy to give a little background on that. Um, yeah, when I was when I was going through grad school, uh, I was 100% traditional, you know, humanists doing the ancient Greek philosophy, translating texts in the library. Um, and uh, it's not an obvious transition uh, to start, you know, being part of the, the, the technical side of things. Um, there was a little bit of, of uh, luck involved uh, and um, a little bit of personal interest also. Um, I've always been someone who's, you know, personally interested in, you know, seeing what's new in the world. Um, and right now, you know, a general thing that, that informs our, our culture and our society is, you know, these, is, is technology. Um, I use computers a lot, just in the ordinary everyday run of things. And even though I have no formal training, you know, in coding or programming or anything like that, um, 
it occurred to me that knowing something beyond the superficial about using technology was probably going to be an advantage to me professionally, um, even if you know I'm not a technologist as such. And so just on my own, I started to informally explore a little bit further um, and get familiar with, with sort of deeper use of technology in teaching and learning. Um, as it turns out, right, there was a there was a sort of timely opening job opening at my institution, and uh, I stepped in, as I thought temporarily, to be the coordinator of academic technology, and it turned out to be permanent. Um, with respect to gaming specifically, again, uh, the origin of the the gaming bit was fundamentally personal. Um, I'm a game geek. I have to admit it. Uh, in my personal life, um, board games, video games, uh, you name it. And I started to realize, as I sort of broadened my circles in, in social media, that there was uh, some really interesting, at that time, tentative scholarship uh, that I became aware of, folks that I knew uh, who were starting to get interested in this. Uh, and I, I took it upon myself to, to poke a little further and see what was going on. Um, and I liked it. And I thought it was valuable the more I saw. Uh, and that's really the story. Great. I want to, one other question before we go forward. So again, one of the participants, Scott Nicholson, raises the question that the definition of gaming you provided was very much based on volunteer, whether it's children playing or those of us as adults who play golf or any other activity. How does that change when it goes into the classroom, when it in all likelihood is no longer a volunteer activity? Scott, that is really an important question. Uh, and thank you for bringing that up. Um, I don't know that I have discovered a good answer to that because you know you're, it's it's exactly right that in in probably greater than ninety percent of of the classrooms you know situations that we teach in um, there really is uh, an unavoidable sense of necessity or, or dare I say compulsion uh, whether it's you know the necessity of finishing you know this set of credits for a degree uh, or or any other sort of motivating factors. I don't know ultimately whether gaming and education uh, can overcome that at root. Um, what I do know uh, is that in my own case, as a humanist, as someone who's very committed to you know, the liberal arts tradition, um, I see it as fundamental to what I want to accomplish to help students realize a sense that learning for its own sake uh, is something valuable. Um, and so I do what I can. Um, I, don't, I don't necessarily think that I make my, my course something absolutely voluntary, um, because at the end of the day, students really do have to maintain a certain GPA in order to maintain their uh, financial aid and so forth. Um, but I think that even if that is an unavoidable uh, underpinning to the experience, uh, I think that there's some degree of, of voluntary participation um, in the day-to-day -day classroom experience that I can bring to it, and I think that that's a valuable thing. Great. Just very quickly, again, for those of you who have joined us late, we are recording this uh, webinar, and we will be sending out an email at the end of the day or tomorrow that will provide a link both to the archive as well as to the PowerPoint slides in PDF format. Also, we've had a couple of folks, Gerald, who have asked, how did you get started, given that your background clearly is not technical? Rather than take time, I'm conscious of the clock. My suggestion is perhaps if you could provide a bibliography or some suggestions that we can append as part of the email later today or tomorrow, that might be a way to provide a path for folks who want to follow yours. And with that, let's go forward into the origin story. All right? Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, so here's the origin story in a nutshell. Um, you're seeing uh, several graphics here laid out. Um, in the fall, right after the, the end of the fall 2011 semester uh, at my college, I had just wrapped up teaching a course uh, in philosophy. And um, my college at that particular moment in time was also in the middle of transitioning to a new uh, learning management system, uh, you know, the, the platform, software platform that the college uses to provide online course spaces. I thought, my goodness, wouldn't this be a neat opportunity to do something different with my teaching? You know, new system push the limits, uh, see, what, see what I can do with it. And this is about the same time that something very interesting happened in my personal life that was really a catalyst. Um, and that is this webcomic that I've, I've included on the screen here. Um, I'm a fan of webcomics. I told you I was a geek. Um, but this particular webcomic uh, called 
Dresden Kodak. Um, the artist came up with a, a sort of funny couple of, of, of panels about uh, a game called Dungeons and Discourse, uh, playing on the traditional trope of Dungeons and Dragons, of course, but with a philosophical twist. Um, I happened to be reading this at about the same time, and I thought, my goodness, what, what an opportunity. I would love to realize this. Uh, so I, I contacted the artist and got his permission to, to use the name. And during that semester break, I worked feverishly uh, to pull it together. Um, also during that time, um, I, as you see there in the lower left, I attended a That Camp Games, which is a wonderful opportunity for me to talk to, to peers, not only in education, but also in game design, uh, and, and generate, generate a lot of really great feedback uh, for what I was about to do. So, of course, any well-designed course starts with a whole lot of pre-planning. Uh, and one of the key things that I tried to do during this uh, semester break was to try and understand in a, in a sort of very careful and direct way, um, what are the elements of a typical game experience as I was thinking about it? And what sort of clear parallels can I draw between those elements and the, the sort of necessary and standard elements of a course? And this is illustrating some of the key ones, uh, the key parallels between game elements and course elements that I saw uh, as I was planning for this experience. Um, every good game has a goal, of course, an ultimate goal to save the princess, to, you know, to, to defeat the evil bosses. Um, and, you know, in a typical course experience, uh, you know, the syllabus tends to provide uh, explicit goal for this course experience. Um, there are certainly different levels and worlds that one progresses through in a game. Uh, likewise, I envisioned in a typical course, there are units or modules um, which represent a clear path forward uh, and a sense of progress. Um, quests in a game, uh, I thought those more or less corresponded to quizzes or assessments, right? Um, boss battles, right, being those periodic uh, challenges that are, are somehow bigger or, or, or stronger or more challenging than typical ones. Um, I thought of those in terms of assignments and collaborations, which are tools within my college's learning management system. NPCs, non-player characters, right? So those, those random characters in a video game that one, in, one encounters occasionally uh, that you know, provide a cryptic clue uh, or a bottle of potion or something like that. Um, I, thought of that and I thought, we need to provide that in the course space. And so within the discussion boards, I came up with the character of Del the Oracle, uh, who was a persona who existed only in the discussion boards, uh, but was always there to answer students' questions um, in a cryptic way, uh, but usually helpful. Player statistics over on the game side corresponding to player profile pages in the, in the learning management system. And I will spend some time talking about those in a bit uh, because those were really important as it turns out. XP or experience points corresponding to the particular skills uh, that in a traditional course one wants the students to achieve. Scrolls corresponding to files, whether it's eBooks or PDFs. Uh, and again, I'll spend a little bit of time talking about how I dealt with that issue. And the objects that a player collects throughout exploring the world. Um, I created object pages uh, that actually connected back to students' player profile pages. So that was my starting point. And then I went to town. Uh, I developed the world of Sophos. Right? Um, this is the map that you're seeing on our screen right now. Uh, the world of Sophos is divided into regions. These regions correspond to the main branches of you know, philosophy as traditionally presented in an intro to philosophy course. And I guess I, I should say uh, this was an intro to philosophy course that I was designing at this point. So um, students got this map. So they had a visual of this, this hypothetical realm of Sophos. Um, and we saw how we would progress through these regions, one corresponding to logic and epistemology and ethics and metaphysics and so forth. Um, because this was a face-to-face -face course, all right, and I should say that outright too, this was not a fully online course. This was a face-to-face -face with an online component to it. So a great deal of the material was presented to students in our learning management system online, um, but we met twice a week, normal schedule, um, and the meeting that we had twice a week was what, I, what you see in the corner, the lower right-hand corner here, the marketplace of ideas. Um, I stayed in character throughout the semester. 
right? Uh, and, and it seemed to me that this was an important way to reinforce uh, the power of the game environment. When we met in class, I did not step outside uh, of the narrative of the game and start saying, all right, so when you were playing the game, did you read this scroll? No, in fact, I said, all right, you've been traveling around Sophos. Did any of you discover the scroll here? Um, and I had a persona myself. I was a merchant in the marketplace of ideas. And our twice weekly meetings were uh, opportunities for students to come together to buy and sell, in quotation marks, uh, good ideas and questions, right, which had value in the marketplace. So um, there was a great deal of, of immersion, uh, and, and that seemed to be a really important thing uh, to maintain the flow uh, of the game experience. The first uh, region that we encountered is, is called Thalma, uh, which is, is a little bit of an ancient Greek pun. So some of my, my humanistic background coming in here because Thalma means wonder in ancient Greek. Uh, and of course, all philosophy begins in wonder. So uh, some of the quests and some of the questions that students explored, you see here, you know, breaking the school life barrier, um, this issue of transfer, again, getting that in early. What's, what's the value of curiosity, motivations for learning, and so forth? Um, the next region that we encounter from there was Logos, the region of Logos, uh, where we do a little bit of introduction into some of the basics of reasoning, deductive and inductive reasoning, some fallacies, methods of proof. Um, after that, we move on to epistemology, the nature of knowledge. Uh, and again, further, further delving into issues of proof and evidence, uh, the feeling of certainty, fallibility, and skepticism. And beyond that, the region called further Phusis, uh, again, an ancient Greek pun, metaphysics, uh, about the nature of reality. So, you know, some of these, these uh, stereotypically big philosophical questions about free will and determinism, the existence of God, personhood, material and non-material objects, and so forth. Um, and we wrapped up the semester uh, in the region of ethos, uh, the nature of values, of course, ethics and morality, uh, starting with, you know, principles, and systems of ethical reasoning and moving on to issues in applied ethics, right? So that's the overview of the world. When students first came in, they had no idea, of course, what they were getting themselves into. Um, <laughs> and, and so uh, I introduced myself in the first day of class, gave them the traditional syllabus, uh, talked about how this course fits in, you know, to the progression of courses in the philosophy major and so forth here at the college. Um, but then I told them that they were, if they stuck with this course, they were in for a very different sort of experience. And I explained the outlines of the game um, up front with them. You know, I said, look, you are going to be in this game with me. I am going to be in it with you. And um, we're going to see what happens. It is very much an experiment. Um, I want your feedback. If you want to stay, fantastic and welcome. Uh, if not, uh, there are other sections that are available to you. And uh, you know, no hard feelings. It's not for everyone. And I thought that was an important thing uh, you know, in, in, in bringing students in to the experience. Um, I am a huge fan of gaming, but it's important that I be realistic about it. Uh, gaming and education uh, is not a panacea. Right? Uh, and there you know, are occasionally students um, who, for whatever reasons, might not be interested in or might not be ready for, uh, you know, this sort of full immersion into a game experience. So uh, I wanted to be very respectful of where students were coming from uh, in this regard. So for those who stayed, sure. Let's, let's, um, sure. I was going to ask, let's talk about the students who stayed and the students who didn't. Uh, your comments suggested, in fact, there were if not parallel courses or sections, at least students had some options for whatever their requirements were, either uh, pre-requirements for the major or distribution requirements to take your course or what we might politely term a more conventional course. What was the student sure. reaction to this game, to the gaming approach as opposed to, let's, let's politely say, more conventional approaches? Sure. Um, student reaction uh, sort of spanned the gamut, honestly. Um, I've taught this now for two semesters, and you know there is only so much one can generalize, you know, from a sample of two semesters. But um, how large were these classes? I'm sorry. So, by the way, uh, you, you yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, I ended up with 15 students the first time around, and uh, 20 students completed the course uh, in the second semester that I taught it. 
So, uh, you know, not huge, not, these are not uh, massive lecture sections. Um, and students generally, I, I would have to say, seemed intrigued at first. Um, and, and most of them brought an open-mindedness and a willingness to try this crazy thing uh, that I was proposing to them. There were absolutely a small number, uh, you know, who approached me afterwards, after the first day, uh, and, you know, basically told me, look, um, I have jobs, obligations, uh, other commitments. Um, I am, or simply, I'm not the sort of person who likes this gaming thing. I just want to take the course. Am I going to be able to do that? Uh, or, you know, am I going to have to drop and try and find something else? And for those students, I said, look, you absolutely can stick with this if you want to. Um, there are strong enough correlations between the game practices and the traditional academic practices that if you are not interested in taking quests, uh, then take them as quizzes. If you're not interested in finding scrolls, read them as assigned readings. Um, it was absolutely possible to make those interpretations and treat it uh, as a traditional course. And it worked for those students who wanted it that way. Great. A couple of technical questions. Uh, a couple of people have asked, what was the LMS? I believe there was a logo for Canvas on one of the earlier slides. Is that correct? That the, uh, Mass College had migrated from, a, from another system to Canvas by infrastructure? Uh, yes, that's There's, right. We, we're, we're using Canvas by infrastructure, yes. Okay, and the other couple of, one of some of the other technical questions, people are wondering about what software did you use? If you could just kind of some quick references mm. so we can, again, be conscious of the clock. Yes, absolutely. Um, so there wasn't a great deal of, of uh, specific software that I ended up using, which is a plus in my book, um, because I don't have the technical background, as I said. Um, I used the, the Canvas learning environment, um, which allowed me to do a whole lot of, of plug and play type stuff. So building these pages that I've, I've been putting up on the slides, uh, most of this is simply you know, uh, uploading images, positioning them on a, a page, uh, and doing a lot of typing and hyperlinking. Um, there was not any uh, necessary extra software or I didn't even need to know how to code uh, or I didn't even need to know HTML. Um, it, it was a very drag and drop sort of experience uh, and I think that's so, that a definite plus. So mere mortals could do what you've done? Uh, I am a mere mortal. Uh, <laughs> so yes, right. absolutely. And, and again, just to talk about the student population, these are not necessarily students who were going to be philosophy majors. Some were undergraduates who had to do distribution requirements. Others may have been interested in the humanities, but not necessarily uh, majoring in philosophy. That's exactly right. Uh, as a you know, philosophy 100 course, this is a course that met you know general education requirements at the college. 99% um, uh, freshmen, first semester freshmen at the college. Uh, yep. These are not specialists in anything, so uh, that was that's a good sense of who the population was. Great. Let's continue. All right. So, um, I should talk briefly about the sense of student ownership uh, that I thought was an important element in the course experience. Um, I talked earlier about the player profile pages. This is a, a, a mock-up of one of them done with my own information. Every student got a page like this in the course space with their name and different places uh, for game elements to be tracked. Um, students were encouraged to you know, write up a little biography of themselves and put that on their page, upload a photo of themselves. And then you see that there are multiple places for progress. Uh, these different tables that I built on the page of skills and spells and objects um, and even gold pieces down there at the bottom. What I thought was really important was that students, the, the only, that the only feedback students get not be uh, a single, you know, combined grade as in a traditional classroom experience. Um, the experience of the game is multifaceted. Uh, and so I thought that was really important for students to see actualized uh, throughout, throughout the game experience. Each region got an introductory page where students got a little bit of a mini story uh, about each region and perhaps some you know, introductory materials for them to read, whether as hyperlinks to external websites uh, or embedded PDFs or articles or other sorts of media. This is the introduction page to Thalma, that introductory uh, introduction to wonder. Um, and the, the, the quests are listed down at the bottom and students simply click on each of those hyperlinks to, to begin each of the quests. Um, this is just another shot of the welcome page to the next region, Logos, uh, where you can see that one of the 
uh, one of the big introductory resources was this video uh, on evaluating arguments that I wanted students to have available to them. Uh, it was really great to be able to uh, keep all of the materials and resources together uh, so that students didn't have to go uh, poking around trying to find things in the files region, which is different from the introductory region and so forth. Um, this is a quest. Uh, and in fact, this is either the first or the second quest, I'm trying to remember now which, uh, that students encountered. Um, and it presents, you can, if you can uh, sort of read that introductory paragraph, I'm not sure of the resolution of the slide, but students get this story, in-game story, that they're wandering in these mountains and they discover Plato's cave where they find a monument to this ancient traveler. Of course, Socrates, uh, who gave his life in the pursuit of truth. Uh, the scroll you see below uh, is an ebook version of Plato's Apology. Uh, and that is where students read it through, bring it to the next marketplace, that is to say the next meeting in class, uh, and go to town, have discussions, uh, bring me questions uh, for the marketplace, uh, and, and generate the discussions that hopefully are going to lead them to um, successful completion of the quest. Speaking of which, this is what a quest ended up looking like. Uh, back on that original uh, slide that had the correspondence between game elements and course elements, I said that quests in a game were more or less corresponding to quizzes uh, in the course environments. So this is, this is an online quiz uh, in the particular LMS that our college uses. Students um, basically got three levels of feedback from me when they took one of these. I could say to them, retry. Uh, if, if they didn't quite get everything that they needed out of the quest, I encourage them you know, to say, all right, let's do it again. Here's some things to think about. Did you look at this section of the, of the, of the scroll? Um, or if they did what would traditionally be called a, a passing uh, grade, uh, I gave them feedback that said, congratulations, you've completed the quest. Um, and I also added, by the way, if you want to retry it again and do a little better, you could possibly earn the bonus object associated with this quest. And then the third level is, of course, you've completed the quest and congratulations, you've earned this bonus object. Um, so in the gradebook, of course, this did break out into numbers. Uh, and so I could you know, track with more precision as I needed to. But the, the feedback that students got from me directly um, was this threefold sort of feedback that tended to reinforce uh, the gaming aspect of it, um, which is, I thought, really critical uh, to encourage students to retry, which is more or less the, the, the sort of experience that we want in a game. Periodically, at the end of each region, of course, there would need to be a boss battle. Uh, and here's an example of, of one of the boss battles. This is the Dread Sophist. Uh, and in this sort of experience, students actually gathered together in groups and worked together uh, rather than singly, as they did in the quests and quizzes. So um, students got a great deal of, of backstory and, again, uh, multimedia support. Um, they got a space in the online learning environment to work collaboratively. That's what you're seeing in the multicolors on the right-hand side uh, as a sort of multiplayer collaborative document, um, which their group then brought into class and presented live. So. Uh, this experience of the boss battle was, of course, collaborative. It was very highly personalized right, to each of them, as I worked with each group independently. Uh, it was hybrid in quotes in the sense that it, it, it went beyond the text and encouraged students to reach out to other resources and work together in person outside of the class environment. And it was fully transparent. You know, I had the tools available to me to track group participation uh, and the work that they were doing throughout, which was really great. So analytics and feedback, uh, a big deal these days, of course, uh, trying to understand uh, what, are the, what are the ways available for us to, to carefully measure uh, what students are doing and what we're doing. Um, now, these are some, some screenshots of different tools that were available to me uh, in the learning environment that I've got. Um, the upper left-hand screenshot is some basic uh, participation statistics. Um, that my LMS tracks uh, in terms of page views and logins and, and the degrees of, of participation and assignments. Um, I already talked in the upper right hand corner about the, the, the player profile pages, which I thought of as a really important mechanism for feedback between me and the students. Um, it really seemed to keep them engaged uh, throughout rather than simply waiting on the mid-semester warnings or that sort of thing. 
Uh, in the lower left, um, I used modules function uh, in my environment to sort of keep track of students' progress throughout each region. Um, and in the center of the screen was an interesting experimental thing that uh, my IT folks here at the college are working on, which is uh, really cool and I have no idea how it works, but it's a way of visualizing participation in discussions. So instead of, uh, you know, when students have an online discussion, uh, instead of having to scroll down through and read, uh, you know, each, each student's participation, um, there's a way to uh, track it visually uh, and to see who's at the center of the discussion, who's doing the most responses. Uh, and that's a really useful uh, thing to be able to have. What I did provide to students um, periodically throughout the semester formally uh, was a score sheet. This is a score sheet that I gave them. And as you can probably tell, it's not your traditional uh, mid-semester report. Um, and in fact, the score sheet, like everything else, was framed within the narrative of the game. Um, it emphasizes students' achievements right, and the progress that they've made in different ways. So there are six uh, major skills that students uh, have to build up throughout the course of the game. Um, and I give them feedback. I say, look, you have, you have built up plus three in rhetoric so far, um, plus six in, in uh, whatever else. Uh, that, that uh, screenshot graphic that's included in the lower half of the, of the uh, sheet uh, is a snapshot of their actual grades as recorded in the gradebook. Um, and then I tell them what this more or less amounts to uh, in terms of a traditional grade, if, they, if that's really important to them or they want to know that. Um, and in order to get the score report, you know, I encourage students to come and talk to me face to face. Um, again, you know, my school is not a huge one. We're not really going big into MOOCs yet. Um, and so it was important to me to make sense of, of the online environment as a supporting piece for the face-to-face. -face. Now, I could flip it the other way. Uh, for those students who really uh, did want or need to see their progress in terms of the traditional view, um, the environment certainly provided that. Uh, and I would again just reinforce that the game environment is not a one-size-fits-all uh, phenomenon. And for those students who want to do the traditional thing, I thought it was important uh, to be able to accommodate that effectively. So um, these are a few resources. Uh, of course, there are a million and three uh, that are out there. Um, I mentioned earlier that I'm a big proponent uh, of open educational resources. Um, in case you were wondering, these graphics and so forth that I was using throughout my course, uh, the media, uh, the readings, uh, I made a conscientious effort to find uh, all of these media uh, from open sources um, rather than from closed sources. So, you know, you can approach this in different ways, um, but these are a few of the sources that I personally used. And uh, with that, I think I'm going to pause and see where we stand. Thank you, Gerald. We have a number of questions, some of them technical, some of them pedagogical. Let me kind of run through a couple of these. Uh, let's begin with analytics because and, and feedback, this is a really big issue as you and our audience know these days. Uh, looks like you were giving your students a lot more than the kind of feedback, if you will, and you were getting more than yes. often instructors get during this process. Uh, the flippant question would be, how did that work out for you? So tell us, how did that work out for you and how did that work out for them? Yeah. Um, it, it may sound like a flippant question, but I absolutely recognize and respect the validity of that question. Um, it is tough, right? It, it is an absolutely hard thing to, to deal with ongoing feedback like that. Um, it worked out well, I would say, in general. Specifically, um, certain pieces of the feedback loop did take more effort on my part. So uh, for instance, here's a, here's a for instance, the, the quizzes, the quests, right? Um, it's kind of hard to do multiple choice quizzes in philosophy, just saying. Um, so primarily the, the, the quest questions were essay or short answer. And so those were not automatically graded by the software or anything like that. And so every time a student had to submit something, of course, I had to read it with my own eyes and type feedback with my own fingers. And since I gave students a lot of leeway to retake or retry quizzes, um, I did generate a fair, fair amount of work for myself uh, in that regard. Um, that was tough. Um, I think it was ultimately worth it. Um, 
but it did take effort. Um, on the other hand, some of the other feedback loops, uh, for example, the analytics, uh, the automatic analytics within the online software uh, or the discussion tracking feature, the vis visualization feature, those were nice because those were somewhat more automated and taken care of and I could simply check in with them from time to time. So um, I'm afraid I don't have a simple answer to that, but um, I think that depending upon you know, your discipline, uh, you, know, you may find yourself needing to, to, to dig in and, and take a deep breath and, and be prepared to, to, to sit down every day, uh, maybe, maybe for a little bit longer than you, you might have otherwise to give feedback. And what about the student side on this? I mean, how did students react to getting what looks to be a lot more in the way of feedback than, again, they might get in a conventional course, even a, a conventional course on the same material? Yeah. Um, I, I like to think that the students uh, recognized uh, that it was something valuable to them. Um, and anecdotally, I can say that uh, as compared with other past semesters when I taught you know, the, the, the same curriculum in a traditional format, um, I did seem to get uh, a great deal more uh, student communication, frankly, uh, requests to meet with me during office hours. Um, the, you know, this past spring semester, which is the second semester that I taught it, uh, something like 80, 85% of my students contacted me unprompted to, to make an appointment for an office hour, uh, which is, I, let's just say, remarkable. <laughs> and were they appealing a grade or were they, out, were they there for a discourse no. about content? <laughs> Uh, no, and that's the wonderful thing. Uh, this was this was throughout the semester. This wasn't you know a landslide of requests in the last week. You know, asking about makeup requests or extra credit. Uh, this was sort of consistently throughout the semester, just wanting to stop in and 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 chat about you know this Bertrand Russell piece on the value of philosophy or this you know Plato dialogue. Uh, it was it was really fantastic, and I'd love to chalk it all up to my approach, but we'll see. Well, maybe you should. A couple of other questions that have come in. Uh, a number of folks are asking you about doing this online. You said that this essentially was a, an on-campus course, obviously with a lot of online components. What if this course would be taught completely online? C could you imagine that? Could you visualize that? Uh, how yeah. much more would be involved on the part of the instructor and the necessary infrastructure to make it work and also on the students? Mm -hmm. um, that's an awesome question. Uh, I can visualize this happening in a fully online uh, instance. Um, in terms of what I would need to, to change, uh, I think I would have to think a lot more seriously about uh, that feedback issue that I mentioned earlier about uh, what sort of, of assessments and, and feedback mechanisms um, could be translated into a fully online environment. Um, I'm, I'm thinking, of course, in, in terms of MOOCs. Uh, uh, this is not, the way I've taught it so far is certainly not scalable as is. Um, I would have to figure out more effective ways to maybe involve uh, peer editing uh, and some of these other mechanisms. But uh, in terms of the content uh, that's presented to students uh, and the, the learning environment and the media and so forth, um, I feel pretty confident that uh, this, could be, this could be repurposed into the fully online space. And we've had a question about gender issues, that often games are uh, perceived or may have uh, certain issues about access or, or, or perception of bias in terms of games, men versus women, boys versus girls. Admittedly, your, yeah. your sample of students was small, you, uh, 15 in one section, 20 in another. A anything that comes to mind in that context? Um, it's a it's a real serious thing to think about, um, and and it's really important to be mindful of that. Um, in my own two cases, uh, you know, uh, male students did outnumber female students the first time around um, in that first semester of 15. Um, but the second time around, it was reversed. There were in fact more women uh, in the course than than men. Um, those are those are really hard and important issues to think about and uh, and be aware of. Uh, I know that. Um, you know, there's there's serious scholarship being done around issues of, of uh, gender roles and and perceptions in gaming. Um, I'm not going to tell you I'm any sort of expert in those fields, but I certainly recognize the validity of the concern and and it would encourage anybody who wants to do this uh, to give that some serious thought. Um, so another issue that uh, emerges. It's not a, it's not a, yeah. 
in design is, is also the issue about another issue that emerges in the, in the issue of design for something like this is essentially access for students with disabilities. Um, there, there's some yeah. anecdotal data, some, some work that I've done with WCET that suggests that in many instances that responsibility lies with faculty as opposed to folks that might have some expertise in this area. Again, drawing yeah. on your experience in, in the design and the development of this, the issue of, of accessibility for students with disabilities. Yes. Uh, again, gaming another huge general? issue. Yeah. Yes. Um, you know, I certainly can't speak to gaming in general. Um, I do know that uh, a lot of uh, a lot of the, the responsibility for these sorts of issues does ultimately, in most cases, devolve to the faculty. Um, I suppose uh, there might be institutions uh, that are large enough to to have uh, course designers uh, who would help mediate some of these questions. Um, my institution is not one of those, um, and course design really does come down to the individual faculty member uh, and and that person's responsibility. Um, I think that you know as as online platforms and learning management systems are becoming more and more mindful of these things, um, there are ways to build in media. Um, with mechanisms for for accessibility, um, in my own case, you know, as a small institution, again, it's not scalable, but we have got a really tight community such that uh, a student who needed access, you know, issues uh, who needed uh, accommodations uh, is able to really work with our, our faculty here on campus um, for the support that they need. I think a number of reading reading both the text of some of the comments and between the lines or with a hyperactive inference engine on my part. I think a number of folks are both impressed and potentially intimidated by what they see or assume to have been a tremendous amount of work to go from zero to course in this context as opposed to a more conventional model. So wow. again, you indicated, as I, if I recall correctly, this was a new course for you the first time you taught it. Uh, the whole issue of conceptualization, design, moving cup to lip, um, a lot mm -hmm. more, a little more. Uh, the kind of mm. search you had to do for, for tools, resources, um, yeah. efforts to train yourself or assistance you got from others at your institution who, who have formal training or expertise in course design and some of these elements? Mm -hmm. um, I, I absolutely want to address these questions because I do not want anybody to come away from this uh, with, with any sense of intimidation. Um, it's, it's exciting to do this sort of work. Uh, I think it's intensely valuable, and I'm the sort of person uh, who gets excited easily about things that I see as important. Um, but I, I really do want to emphasize the fact that I am no sort of technical wizard. Um, I, I came to this you know, with an enthusiasm, with a background knowledge in my subject matter, um, and a willingness to learn, and you know, a, a bit of a semester break to work on it. Beyond that, um, you know, I I am a rank novice in this, um, quite honestly. Um, I, I had the advantage of, you know, a, a college that gave me, you know, that provided a learning, a online learning environment that was, you know, compatible and adaptable and easy to use with multimedia. Um, searching out resources, um, I asked friends, I asked colleagues. Uh, I went to conferences and asked people there who knew more than I did. Um, and I basically flew by the seat of my pants. Um, the, after the first semester I taught it, I work, reworked a whole bunch of things based on what I saw working and not working, uh, based on the feedback that students gave me from the first semester. Um, this is absolutely a work in progress. This is by no means any sort of grand finished product. Uh, and I, I absolutely recognize that there are things that I will do differently the next time I teach it. Um, please don't anybody think that uh, you should you know, wait to do this sort of thing until you're some sort of expert. By no means do that. Uh, jump in uh, and, and let it be a learning adventure for you as much as for your students. So just to press that a little bit into some sort of expert, also presumably not, you, know, you don't have to wait till you have tenure to do something like this. Uh, a couple <laughs> folks were wondering that uh, did, was there any formal or informal institutional assistance, uh, a work-study student, a graduate assistant, uh, assistance from folks in instructional design, any kind of release time? Or is it, in fact, the kind of you can stand on a podium and say, I did this with, with my screen and my mouse? Um, so there was uh, that first semester that I taught it in the spring of 2012, I did have uh, a teaching assistant. Um, and, and his work was invaluable uh, to just help me uh, maintain the workload. 
especially with some of the some of the you know feedback on on quizzes and quests. But in terms of design, the design work, the course design, and and the researching and, and putting it all together uh, in preparation for the first day, um, that really was uh, you know that really was sort of just independent work that I did. Um, my 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 institution is a small one, and um, you know they're they've been very supportive informally, of course, uh, but uh, you know didn't didn't have the resources available to to really support uh, in 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 other ways. So, uh, for better or for worse, uh, this is my own. <laughs> All right, a couple of people are asking about grades, Gerald. They they want to know, for example, uh, what was the bonus that they were offered if they went back and redid their work. Others are wondering about. Uh, mm -hmm. Compared to teaching the same material in a more conventional way, where the the final grades or the curve or the mean, whatever metric you'd like to use, uh, were they sure. the same? Were they different compared to a, a more conventional class on the same material? Did it change from term one to term two based on, in part, perhaps your experience and your familiarity with the materials and, and the student response and the kind of retooling that you alluded to that you did between uh, the first and the second section? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Good questions. Um, so, in terms of you know, comparing the the curve um, from one semester to the next, um, they were reasonably comparable. Um, you know, I did not see any massive shift. Uh, you know, suddenly, you know, seventy percent of my students weren't getting B pluses or better uh, in the game environment or that sort of thing. Um, I, I tended to see the the expected um, distribution uh, of scoring. Uh, you know, across uh, across the class. So I did not see any distinct um, shift that I could attribute to the to the difference between the traditional presentation uh, of the course material and the gamed gamified, if you like, uh, presentation of it. Um, so I, I can't reach any conclusion. Uh, I'm going to keep doing this and and hopefully accumulate enough data over enough repetitions to maybe uh, draw a correlation that's statistically meaningful. But I haven't got it yet. Hard um, to do. Going yeah, back to the. It's, it's, yeah. It's a challenge to do with small groups, but again, you know, you, there's there's some inferences, and, and hopefully, again, is with more experience, you're able to do a little bit more. I, I want to come to two quick questions, I'm conscious of time, before we close. Uh, mm -hmm. One is a question about what the the mini MOOC will be, and then a uh, question that's come across is, uh, will it be a theoretical? Will there be some technical learning as well? Information about how to create and sort of do what you've done, a framework, templates, also uh, s some guidance about how to create a game and in Canvas, can you a quick response ah. to that? Oh gosh, okay. <laughs> um, the mini mooc, the mini mooc. Sorry. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I would encourage you all to, to to join in on that. It's going to be cool. Uh, you know, the, the, it'll start with some principles uh, of of incorporating game design into educational design, um, and I'm thinking there'll also be some some work in terms of uh, application. Uh, so for those of you who are interested in, in taking some of this on yourselves uh, and maybe experimenting based on what you've heard, um, there will be some, some practical guidance available to you on that. Um, gosh, let's see. What was, sorry, what was, the, what was the latter part of the question? I've refreshed uh, me on that. Effectively, that was, uh, that was it. Also, I think there were some questions about people who have not seen Canvas before. Will, will there be anything specific okay. about Canvas or, or is this portable to other LMS platforms and other environments? Um, so my own experience is certainly within this particular uh, environment, but I do think it's 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 going to be very important to to speak in terms that are are, are transferable, uh, not necessarily tied into one particular product. But you know, no matter what software environment you may be in, uh, some of the important principles of game design and, and, and effective educational design uh, are not going to be tied to uh, any specific software. And I want to come back to one question that, that was sort of alluded to your encouragement that folks shouldn't wait, and that was institutional response. Uh, your primary yeah. responsibility is, is instructional design and support. You're an instructor. Uh, presumably other places might call that an adjunct with philosophy. Uh, did you get a lot of attaboys? Uh, did you res uh, response from your departmental colleagues uh, in, in terms of what you were doing and what you were doing that was a bit different? Yes, um, certainly. Yes, the, my institution and my and my colleagues have been remarkably supportive uh, and encouraging in, in what I'm doing, um, and and that's been really fantastic. Uh, you know, as an institution, as a small liberal arts institution, um, we're always looking to to be you know to be effective to really reach our students. 
Uh, and you know, when, whenever any one of us um, you know, does something that, that catches students' attention and, and makes learning and teaching more effective, uh, we, all, we all benefit from that. So I have been really fortunate uh, to be surrounded by people who have been supportive of that. Well, speaking of benefit, there have been a number of comments on, uh, in the Q&A line. People have said that this has been a, a great webinar. And Gerald, you get all the credit for having done that. I think we've had a no, very no. effective, very informative, very successful hour. I'd like to remind our participants uh, to register for the full micro MOOC game, Elements for Learning. You, and again, you will be getting a follow-up email that will have a link to the URL for the archive. If you'd like to share this with colleagues, it'll have access to the full set of slides used for this presentation, some other supplemental materials, and also how to register for the micro MOOC. And with that, our time has come to our end. Gerald Petrozula at Mass College for Liberal Arts, uh, thank you for your time and for your expertise, for your insight, and for your enthusiasm on the topic of game elements for learning. And with that, Thank our you. thanks also to all of you in the audience for joining us this afternoon.